All right, so today's guest speaker is actually my mom. <laughs> um, no family resemblance, but I really am his biological mother. <laughs> um, her name is Joanna Hoffman. She um, moved to the United States as a uh, young teen from the Soviet Union, then went to MIT, and after a short stint doing some archaeology-related research and other things, she ended up at Apple, where she was on the Mac team, um, and saw that whole project evolve all the way to the launch of the first Macintosh, went on to do other startups, and so these are some of the things that we're gonna talk about. What I'm going to do is ask some questions and have her tell a little bit of her story, and then, um, and then open it up for you to ask questions since a lot of uh, anecdotes and, and fun background info she has on those days that have recently been spoken about a lot more, you know, how the Mac was made and so on and so forth. I should also point out as a funny thing, the reason I exist, um, she met my dad um, at Apple and she was his boss. So, um, <laughs> This is continued at home as well. Uh, but, uh, you know, a reversal from, I guess, the typical situation. So, um, so to start, maybe give us the pre, like how did you end up at Apple? Especially since the stuff you were doing right before, I mean, you had done some techie stuff, but you know, how does one who's doing archeology span end up on the Mac team? There's a story behind that, right? Um, yes, well, there is a story. I was actually um, in, um, uh, at the University of Chicago, and they have a, um, a, a study center called the Oriental Institute, which is the Center for Near Eastern Studies and Archaeology. And if you've seen the um, the what is it called the, 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 of the search for the ark, or the, anyway, there was a big movie made based on one of the archaeologists uh, of the uh, from the Oriental Institute. They were all these swashbuckling uh, searchers for um, antiquities and so on. So it was a it, it was a crazy place in the sense that uh, they went to remote places and did digs to find out about ancient civilizations. So that's where I went. And I was supposed to go to Iran to do a dig when the Iranian Revolution happened. And so I was halfway uh, there. I was visiting my grandmother in Poland. And then uh, the, essentially, I got a note saying, don't come to Iran. They're taking Americans hostage. So, <laughs> so uh, that, was, um, that was the end of that adventure. And so before I uh, decided what, else, what was for me next, it, it uh, uh, my friends in California, uh, I went as an undergrad to MIT, and a lot of my friends ended up in California because of the high-tech industry. So my friends in California said, come here, chill out for a while, and then, you know, uh, you can decide what you want to do. So I came out here, and uh, at that time, there was this amazing research place called Xerox Park. Uh, I don't know if you have any, have any of you heard about it? I, okay, so this is a legendary place. This is in the days when Xerox was spending a huge amount of money hiring the best people on the planet to, be res to do research into, uh, into computing of, and the computing of the future. So not only did uh, they do uh, premier work in risk technology in semiconductors, for example, they did amazing work in user interfaces. They were the first to invent uh, a graphical uh, user interfaces, point and click, object-oriented uh, programming, on-screen tools. I mean, it went on and on and on. So um, I ended up at, at uh, Xerox because some of my friends worked there, and I became a volunteer to play with all their toys and, and a test subject and kind of try and break their toys. So um, they also would have these amazing seminars. They would have people come from all over the world to give talks on their research, as well as people would come from the industry. It was a very open place, just like it would be in an academic environment, even though it was privately uh, owned by Xerox. And uh, so it was very open. 
and uh, there were people there from Apple who would come regularly to listen to some of the lectures. And I was listening to one of the lectures, and one of the people at Apple afterwards approached me and said, look, I heard you ask a few questions, and I really liked uh, the way you think. Would you like to uh, come for an interview to work at Apple because I am starting a project? And uh, it's going to be called the Macintosh because it's my favorite kind of Apple. That was his... Uh, uh, that I'm quoting him now. And uh, so come and, uh, you know, we'll see if we get along. So, uh, so that, I think the audience mis might be assuming that this person is Steve Jobs, because he's, of course, oh, well, I'm, Mr. Uh, Apple. So who, right. who was this person? <laughs> this person was uh, Jeff Raskin, and he was uh, this very eclectic person. He had been uh, actually hired by Apple to do their first user and technical documentation for the Apple II. I don't know if you guys even know that that existed, but Apple actually started out not with the Macintosh, but with the Apple II, which was an enormously successful personal computer um, in the late 70s and early 80s. So he had managed to convince people at Apple that there was, it was time for Apple to try something completely new and to do something with leading ed tech, uh, edge technologies and that Apple should have an, a research team. So um, I went to talk to him because I was really intrigued. And should I tell him about my interview process? But to confirm, you were on vacation basically at this time, right? Uh, yeah, I'm basically you know, taking some time off before I go back to my PhD program at the University of Chicago. I'm also heavily in debt because one year at the University of Chicago cost me as much as four years at MIT. So I thought, Ugh, maybe it's time to earn a little bit of money, right? Um, so um, the, my interview process was I got... I, um, it was an address in Cupertino, not very far from here, actually. And uh, I came, and it's a private home. So, I, and the door was slightly open, right? So it was not, it was ajar, it was not closed. And I hear music playing inside. So then I thought, am I supposed to go in? Am I supposed to ring the bell? What am I supposed to do here? But then I thought, okay, well, the music is playing, I don't want to interrupt, so I opened the door, I walked in, and inside, there were all these acoustic panels all over the room. The room is quite dark because of these acoustic panels. And there is the gentleman who I met, sitting at a piano, playing. Just, it was an empty room, do just the piano. So, and a chair next to the piano. So I sit down next to the piano, and he continues playing. And he kept playing and playing and playing. And finally, he stops. And he says, what did you think? So I said, well, you know, I really liked it. I enjoyed it. But I didn't quite recognize what it was. It sounded like Debussy. But it, it's no piece I had ever heard by Debussy. So, to make, so he says, well, you know, it's a piece I composed myself. It's called Airs on Debussy. So <laughs> I, I got my first question right. So after that, the, um, the more we spoke, the more we liked each other. And I landed at Apple as the fifth person on the Macintosh project. So there was a hardware engineer, a software engineer, a technical documentation slash jack of all trades, uh, Jeff, who started the project, and then me. How big was Apple at the time, like outside of the Mac team? I was I was employee number 327, I think. That was my badge number. So, yeah. <laughs> Not many. But they considered themselves already pretty big, right? So after I joined, they, uh, a month after I joined, they went public because they had hit their uh, target revenue and they went, went public. But, uh, Do you remember what the valuation of the company was? You know, I think it was... Uh, 500 million. So it was already like an established thing. Right, but I think their revenues were only 100 million or something. Right. So, Silicon Valley math. Yeah, well, it was, no, it was in those days, it was, you know, it was actually, oh, wow, it's not like now, billion dollar valuations. It was, uh, yeah. So, um, so anyway, so that's how I landed at Apple. And then two months after I joined, 
this uh, uh, young person showed up and uh, said, I want to see what you guys are doing. And I could tell, because of everybody was kind of respectful toward him, that this was, must be somebody important. But he was about my age and uh, wearing flip-flops and a t-shirt and kind of going, well, you know, let me see what you're doing. What is this that's going on? And it turned out to be Steve Jobs. And so I joined in October. Steve took over the project officially in December and uh, completely changed what the product was supposed to be and decided it was going to be something very similar to what Apple was already doing with their Lisa product, which was much bigger and more expensive. But it was a lot closer to what Xerox was doing, actually. So I was very familiar with that. And so um, uh, he, he, he kind of could figure out what the other people were doing. But he came to me and said, what are you supposed to be doing? I said, well, I was hired to do user interface research and uh, testing. He said, oh, OK, you can continue doing that, but you'll be my marketing person. I thought, marketing? I don't even know what marketing is. I never, I thought, is that advertising? Like, am I supposed to go out there and say, like, lie about the product to sell it? So, you know, I, I, was just, I thought, oh, I'm not sure I want to do this. But then, um, then he said, no, we're going to be writing the first business plan. We're going to figure out who are going to be the customers and how the product should develop to, to appeal to those customers. And I thought, oh, now no, that could be fun. So what, what year was that? You said this was December of? 1980. I was 25 years old, so, so was Steve. So were almost all the other people on the team, so, so except for Jeff, who was older. So to get the chronology right, Apple was already a big, had a, an Apple II out, right? And they were yes. a, a public yes. company. Yes. And there was this small research project on the side that even oh, yes. Steve Jobs at the beginning wasn't even involved with, even though he was already the boss at Apple, right? Right, right. So there's this, Apple's this big thing, Steve is running the Apple II and the whole company, and then there's like these five people on the side right. that no one really knew about, I guess, and he right. kind of came one day and decided, oh, this is cool. Yeah, I um, want to do this, because they had actually, they didn't want him in the rest of the company. So they kept shoving him out of the way because he was first uh, involved on the Apple II, then he got involved with the Apple III, which was a great product, by the way, which was just uh, very unfortunate that um, all of a sudden, you know, Apple II was very successful, uh, and it was all engineers at Apple. The marketing people were engineers. Everybody was an, was an engineer. For the Apple III, which was supposed to be actually a more professional product, they decided, we're going to hire some marketing people from consumer business. So they hired people who were, like, who were selling tampons. And they were hired people who were uh, selling uh, uh, soap. And those guys absolutely destroyed that, that product, which could have been very successful. And when I was, while I was there, they had something called the Black Wednesday, where the president of the company at that time, who was Mike Scott, he came in with a big bottle of whiskey in one hand and got up in front of all the people and read the names of everybody he was firing. And it was very, Every, every very, week? No, this was one day. It was called the Black Wednesday because this was when the Apple, Apple III was failing. He realized they hired the wrong people. So he came out and he fired all those people that they had hired. But he was so traumatized by it that he kept taking swigs of whiskey before he could. It's, firing people is really, really hard. You don't really do that every day. So anyway, but that was one of the things that had happened with the Apple III. And so Steve couldn't find a place inside Apple. There was also this big project, Lisa, which was ended up costing $10,000. and. They thought that they were professionals. They didn't want somebody uh, who, like Steve. So that they, even though he was the chair of the company, the chairman of the board, he didn't have a project. So that's why he came looking to see what else was happening inside Apple, and he found the, the Macintosh. And uh, so, um, uh, so that's how it all started. And besides Jeff, had any of the people in the Mac team worked on the Apple II before? Uh, no. So you, you were all people with no prior experience in the thing that made the company successful. 
Um, we were all completely naive. So, <coughs> excuse me, the ha hardware engineer was a high school dropout, not high, even a high college, school dropout. high school dropout, who had uh, worked at Apple in service. He was actually fixing Apple II, so he had never been an engineer before. And Jeff, kind of like an Apple, what would be like an Apple genius today, right? Like doing yeah. the servicing. Yeah, servicing, but I mean hardware, right? Opening it up and um, the uh, software, the head of software when I joined was an MD, PhD at the University of Washington. For international <laughs> students, that means like a medical doctor. Medical doctor. He was getting his MD and his PhD in neuropsychology, uh, in neuro, uh, neurophysiology and surgery. So he was a neurosurgeon. So that was, uh, that was the, uh, the head of software. And, um, and then there was Jeff, who had been a musician, who had been a uh, programmer, who had been a prof actually a professor of Pascal, uh, the programming language, at the University of California at uh, San Diego. So he was a jack of all trades. But uh, so no, no one had actually ever worked on a product before. Uh, and I had no idea, it was my first real job. I had only worked as a, when I was an undergraduate because, you know, to defray my tuition, but I never worked in the outside of college. So it was my first job, so yeah. We were all completely new to it, completely. And, uh, you know, learning essentially what we were supposed to be doing while doing it. So what was the original launch date for the Mac? Uh, the Macintosh, the original launch date was uh, January 1981. 81. And you joined in December of 1980. Yeah. So a year after you joined, it was supposed to launch. It was supposed to launch. When did it launch? January of 1984. So three years late. Three years late, yeah. 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 How did it even get done with such a crew of people who were inventing as they went along? Well, you think that was bad. The, the, we built our own factory to produce the Macintosh, right? So not only were we doing, you know, the development of the product and then the figuring out who the market, where the markets were and all of that uh, with people who had never done it before. The manufacturing, which we decided to build our own factory to manufacture Macintoshes right here in Fremont. So we started building the factory and we didn't have a manufacturing person. We, we interviewed, you can't even imagine, we interviewed people from GE, we interviewed uh, people from General Motors, we interviewed people who were supposed to be the best in the United States in manufacturing. Each one of them lasted about a month or two, and then they got fired because they had no idea what they were doing. So finally, Steve came to our head of finance, who was, whose degree was in English literature, and her, um, she had an MBA. She, went, she had undergraduate English literature and then an MBA, and she was running our finances. She was our controller. He came to Debbie and said, Debbie, <clears throat> do you think you could do manufacturing? And Debbie thought about it. She said, I come from a large Catholic family. She said, I think I can run manufacturing. So, <laughs> so Debbie went and essentially built the factory that, that was producing the Macintoshes. That factory produced Macintoshes for many, many years. Uh, before uh, they moved manufacturing abroad. But so that was Debbie, who was also the same age as I was at the time. So she was, maybe when she went into manufacturing, she was 26 or 27, something like that. Yeah. What are some things that um, students would recognize in like the Macs they use or things they know about Apple um, or that you know, general people know about Macs or Apple that you personally worked on or were involved with? Like, oh, that's a thing that exists and that the first one of those was me or whatever. Oh, uh, yeah. well, um, <laughs> okay, so one of the things that I was very interested in was making the Macintosh international. 
uh, because I wanted it to be shipping right away in many countries, right? At that time, American products are rarely bothered to do any kind of what, in, uh, what we started calling localization, making the product uh, appropriate for the local markets. So, um, so one of the major things I did was the first keyboard layout that, uh, that had uh, command keys and so on that, that were not labeled so that you could, um, they were symbolic, right? So they, there was a, I don't know if it's still there, I don't know, there was this funny key that was, it's still there? It's still there? Yeah. Well, that was my key. <laughs> so, but that's, that, that was on the outside of the product. On the inside of the product, uh, we were the first ones to actually create software where um, the, um, Oh, this, this was a, this, uh, I, I felt very guilty about this, but uh, uh, let me tell you the story. So the, the thing is that um, the, the biggest problem with, with localizing software is that the data is mixed in with the code, right? So you have all the text messages, all the menus, and uh, currency formats, everything is right there in the code. So somebody has to go through the code to ch change it. So I, I came to the software guys one day and I said, look guys, this is really very, very bad. Is there any way you can take out all the country specific things, and for that matter, all data, out of the code and make it, uh, make it separate so we can just go edit the text, the currency, or whatever needs to be changed? P lists. Uh-huh. What? Property lists, or what, how, how they manifest themselves most obviously in Xcode right now. Well, we, start, we, we called it resources. So what happened is Bruce Horn, I have to tell you about Bruce. Bruce was 15 years old when he was hired by, by Xerox Park, And he worked on the Smalltalk team. So he was, he was the youngest member of... And, and Smalltalk is the programming language that then was turned into merging with C into Objective-C. So if you were here last summer and you were learning Objective-C, you were doing something that came directly out of Smalltalk, which no one's ever heard of Smalltalk, but it's a language that is very closely related to Objective-C. Yeah. How many people here are um, like 15? Well, yes. <laughs> so he was 15 when he was working on the Smalltalk team. We hired him from Xerox. We stole him away. And he started working with us on the Macintosh software. And I knew he was young and eager and impressionable. So of course I approached Bruce Horn first. And I said, Bruce, can you think of how to do this? Because you know, I'm sure from your experience in small talk, you must have come across these issues. And Bruce got all excited and he went home and overnight designed something and came back the next day and started implementing it. The trouble is that we were supposed to be shipping in six months, okay? So he was going to redesign the whole bottom layer of the software when we're supposed to be shipping in six months, okay? His boss, the engineering manager, at that point we had hired a lot of people, so uh, we were a pretty big team. The head of engineering came and threatened Bruce Horn that he was gonna fire him if he continued working on resources. And so I felt extremely guilty about it, but we all went and pleaded with the, including the software guys who thought, oh my God, this is such a beautiful design, it's so nice, it's so elegant, it's, of course we have to change the software to be like this. So they won, the engineering manager lost, and so. And how much later was the Mac? <laughs> it was later. Uh, but it wasn't the only, that wasn't the only reason, by the way. There were other reasons why it was later, so it, w so it wasn't so bad. But I was so feeling so guilty because uh, poor Bruce got the brunt of the, uh, of the uh, blame. How about human interface guidelines? Oh yeah, human interface guidelines, yes. So, uh -huh. <laughs> there is a story behind everything. Do, do, you, do you know what the human interface guidelines are? Yeah, you... Some of you do. Well, if you Google it, you'll find that it's Apple's, uh, now it's basically turned into the rules you have to follow for your app to get approved on the App Store. So it's like, you know, 
design it in this way and make sure that when a button looks like this, it does this, but not that, and don't confuse your users and all that, all that kind of stuff. But that is perhaps not as not that new of a thing. Um, well, what happened is with the Macintosh, we wanted it to be very easy to use, right? And one of the things that makes things easy to use is consistency. So for example, in the Apple II, if you were in, the, in a word processing program, control Z meant save. In uh, the spreadsheet, control Z meant erase. So it's just a small example, but every program did everything their own way. So it was very, very difficult every time you had to learn something new. What we did with the Macintosh, which was uh, very uh, new at that time, is we put all these calls to the user interface, what you put in the menus, what the menu looks like, the uh, text of the menus, you know, the, the reference to the text, like cut, paste, and you know, uh, uh, delete, and all of that. Uh, everything that you see now, you know, the, the, all of those that you think is standard, we put that in ROM so that the outside developers, the third-party developers who were Just working, applic app writers, would be, wouldn't be tempted to use their own way of doing it because it was already available for them. They could just call it from the RAM and they wouldn't be using precious RAM space, which was at that time only 128K bytes, K bytes. So that was the, that was the, the RAM available on a Macintosh when it first shipped, okay? so. We put all of that stuff in, in, in ROM, but what, what was happening is that we decided we're going to go to third parties very early on and try to get them to start writing the uh, uh, apps for the, for the Macintosh while we were developing it. So one of the first people we went to was Microsoft, actually, and uh, we met up with, um, with Bill Gates and uh, how was he? Oh, he was great. He was really great. He was all excited, and he wanted to do apps for the Mac. He actually said, "Oh, your file system, you know, here's how I would do it." And we actually took his his advice, and we used his version of the file system when we first shipped the Macintosh. It was actually optimized for manipulating the RAM. It was not optimized for a hard disk, so we had to completely redo it in the future when we did have a hard disk. But it was very expedient for the Mac that we had. So he was great, he, was, uh, he had some good ideas uh, and so on. But when his engineers started working on the, on the Mac, I realized there was no documentation to say what was in the ROM, what were the, some of the, what was the user interface. So I put on this, um, at that time it was the Walkman, the Sony Walkman. I don't know if you guys know it must, it's, uh, uh, it was the newest, hottest thing. So I put on the Walkman, I put on Mozart, and I pulled two all-nighters and wrote a document with documenting all the th ways you're supposed to do applications and all the ways you're not supposed to do applications. So those were the first user interface guidelines. We printed them out, shipped them to Microsoft, and then we had several other uh, third-party developers, so we quickly shipped it to them so they could start actually see what their applications were supposed to look like. But anyway, so that was, yes. But then after that, I should say, we hired a real writer. Her name is Caroline Rose, and she became the hero of all the third-party developers because she did all the technical documentation, and she... Uh, she was fantastic. She, they kept her at Apple, and then every company wanted Caroline to write their user interface. Um, one other person I should mention, actually, is uh, the person who did all of our bitmaps, uh, the artist Susan Kerr. And Susan uh, develop, uh, did all the on-screen fonts, and she did uh, uh, all, all the graphics in, on the original Macintosh. So what is interesting is that there were people who were working on bitmap fonts at Xerox Park, at other very prestigious institutions. When they saw what Susan had done, they were all surprised. It was theoretically impossible to do the, 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 the smoothness of the fonts she had achieved in that resolution 
But because she was an artist and she had never read those papers, she didn't know it was impossible, so she did it. So it was really amazing. The, 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 the Helvetica font, people were coming and looking at it saying, is that really possible? I mean, how, how did she do that? But anyway, so it was quite legible and beautiful and she did it because she didn't know it wasn't, it wasn't possible to not do it. So with hindsight, what features might you have cut from the Mac to get it to ship not three years late? Well, <laughs> so here, uh, here's what I have to tell you. I mean, you all probably know the saying in this valley that all startups die of indigestion and not starvation. You know what that means? They try to do too much. That's how, that's certain death, is if you try to do too much. The reason we were so late was because we tried to do too much. Now, in retrospect, what I would have cut, because I was young then, like you, well, you're a little younger than I was, but you are more mature than I was at 25. So, um, <laughs> I can't think of anything that I would have cut. Of course, I, it was, you know, I was just as much at fault as any of the engineers who kept coming and saying, oh, you know, can we put this in? Can we put this in? And then I'd get all excited. And then they'd say, well, the marketing person said that's okay, you know. But um, um, I... Uh, <laughs> How about some features you did cut that if they had stayed in, you would have been five years late instead of three? Well, it's not just... Uh, uh, the, the f so the biggest problem with the Macintosh when we shipped it was that it didn't have a hard disk and it didn't have a good way to interface with the hard disk. Now, can you guys Im even imagine the constraints of, this, of, of, of the memory we're talking about? With the amount of storage you have available, can you even imagine that you have a 400K byte diskette that you have to, and one built-in disk, disk drive, and you keep going like this every time to put in another diskette and another diskette? It's, uh, it was really murderous, and people who bought the original Macintoshes were really people who were so in love with it that they were willing to put up with that. So the biggest problem with it was the lack of a hard disk. And so, and that was, the, 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 there were several, there were stupid reasons for it. The stupid reason was we, there was a product called Lisa, which was supposed to be the bigger, better version of the, you know, the same user interface or similar user interface. And that had a hard disk and was supposed to be bigger and so on. And we were supposed to be the cheaper, smaller versions, so they were afraid that the two would compete. So that's why we didn't put in a hard disk. So. One other thing I should tell you guys that it is much better that you kill your own product in the market than if somebody else kills your product in the market. So any time that a company takes a decision to not produce something so they won't hurt their product, existing product on the market, they will suffer because their competition will do it. So, um, and Apple learned that lesson obviously because they, they never repeated that again. But, um, so that, that was, I think, one of the things that, uh, that should have been put in, that we didn't put in. And frankly speaking, the amount of effort we went to to make sure that it worked with these stupid 400K diskettes probably was much greater than if we had just built in a hard disk. And so, that was, um, that was a, a, an effort trade-off that would have been definitely worth it. Um, a certain early developer of yours that you mentioned came out with an operating system. So first, the Mac was the first one that had a consumer device that had a mouse, right? Consumer device, yeah. yes. And the Finder that they know now was the, invented with the Mac, right? That's right. And as were Windows. Also Bruce Horn, by the way. 15-year-old. Yes. <laughs> well, by the time he came to us, I think he was 18. But, yeah. So there was the Finder, the mouse, Windows. All that stuff was seen for the first time in the Mac by right. the general public. Yeah. And then some other operating system called Windows came out. Um, yes. 
tell us maybe a little bit about that story. Okay, so, so when we first started talking to, to Microsoft to do apps, and they were supposed to do the word, a word processor, spreadsheet, and maybe a, a database. So uh, that's, that's why we first started to talking to them very early on. And uh, they, um, they, of course, had hired a lot of Xerox people of their own. So they were very eager to make these applications, the apps for the, for the Macintosh, uh, but they felt that the market was a little bit limited because the Mac was too, the Macintosh market was smaller and at that time they had uh, done an operating system, which by the way they purchased outside. Anyway, uh, for the IBM PC. You don't even know probably now that it existed, but at that time it was Apple's biggest competition was the IBM PC with a DOS operating system, disk operating system, DOS operating system, done by, um, or at least um, uh, owned and uh, manufactured by Microsoft. That, the, that computer was selling really, really successfully because it had the IBM label on it. And IBM at that time meant computers. That was the definition of computers was IBM. So of course, they came out after the Apple II, after the Apple III, but they took the market like that because of their name. Um, anyway, so, um, what happened is uh, Bill Gates suggested to Apple that Apple license its operating system. He said, well, you know, take the Macintosh, ROM, and all the operating system, and license it to other manufacturers. And Apple said, no, we're not going to do it. And uh, Gates came back to Apple again, and he said, you guys, if you license your operating system, all the third-party developers are going to have a much bigger platform to work with. Please consider licensing it. And Apple said no. Was and it Apple or was it Steve? By that time, it was Apple. It was, Steve was gone already. Uh, well, Steve said no originally. And then it was, it was, Apple was being really recalcitrant. So Gates went off and did it his own. Yeah. And then after Apple, you, you were at startups that also had trouble shipping on time, right? That was kind of a feature. Yeah, yeah. I, this was the curse of almost every startup I worked for. But the, the most notable one was General Magic. And I don't know, if you guys Google General Magic, you will see some of the demos of that product uh, in the 19... Uh, go and look at the videos, is all I can tell you. It was in the 19, uh, 1990s. And essentially, it, it was a much bigger, bulkier version of the iPhone. And uh, it had the, the graphics, the touch screen. I mean, it had a lot of the things that you, are, uh, that you associate with the iPhone. But we were way before the technology was ready for it. So it was bigger and bulkier. None of the wireless was infrastructure was quite there. So it took forever to send anything. Um, you, you had to plug it in to send it fast and so on. So, um, but the user interface was great. The, the functionality was really great. The problem with that, with that was that every time we were supposed to ship, one of the engineers would sneak in another feature. And we had uh, partners. We had uh, Sony, um, Matsushita, Philips. I mean, we had the biggest electronics and telecoms companies as our partners. And we kept sneaking in features just when they thought they were done QAing the product. 
they went nuts with us, and I have to say that I really feel for those partners now. But that was that was uh, that was really bad because we the the money that they had for marketing the product, as the product slipped, that marketing money started dwindling, right? Because they would take that money to do other things with it. And so by the time we shipped, there was very little money available to actually market it, advertise it, and so on. So um, yeah, that was, that, was a, that was a failure of uh, huge proportions at that time in, in, uh, in this industry. Since then, there have been more spectacular ones, but it was a giant failure. Um, we had, I think, all in all, I think we had $68 million of funding. That in, in 90s dollars, which 90s is... 90s dollars and went, went down the tubes, alas. So um, I can't say that it, the only reason was because we were constantly late with actually freezing the product and doing the QA. Uh, but it was one of the major reasons, yeah. Um, there's so much more to explore, but I think might be interesting to have some students ask questions if they have any before I jump in with more. Um, and I think in particular you have this treasure trove of, of Steve Jobs stories that could come out if the right questions are asked. So anyone uh, want to give a question a shot? Um, I have two questions if that's okay. Uh, one is how, how long did you work at Apple? How long did you work at Apple? I worked there for five years. I left uh, just before Steve Jobs left for the first time. Why did you leave? Uh, okay, the reason I left was because all of a sudden Apple went into total chaos because uh, the Macintosh was not terribly successful uh, for the reasons I mentioned, uh, but and um, Apple was becoming very nervous about the fact that uh, the Mac was not succeeding. Uh, they decided that they wanted to replace Steve Jobs. Steve was fighting with, uh, with the, uh, the president of Apple at that time, Scully, whom he had hired, by the way. Steve Jobs had hired John Scully to be president of Apple, and they were having, he and the board of directors, Steve, they were having these fights as to who is going to end up controlling uh, the, the Macintosh division and Apple and so on. And the problem was that after the first Macintosh shipped, uh, and then we shipped the laser writer, after that, all these fights started happening and Steve Jobs was not available, even though he was the head of the division, he was not available to rally the troops to actually continue working on the Macintosh. So what happened is that uh, I and the head of um, engineering were left trying to corral all the people to work on the Mac, to continue fixing bugs, to doing the new version with the hard disk and, and so on, without a head of a division being there to say, come on guys, we are behind you. If you work on this, your work will be in the market. So it was a most demoralized time. People were barely coming to work. Uh, everybody was just completely confused as to what was happening. And the Apple management came to me and said, can you take a whole bunch of engineers and go and do a skunk works uh, and get this done. What is a skunk works? Skunk works, it means that you're like, um, it's unofficial, you have your own building, you are, uh, you are stealth, what today is called stealth. You know, you're not visible to anybody else. You just go with all these engineers and get this done and it was called the Turbo Mac. So um, I, I told them that this is not my job. I can't do it because what we need is we need somebody from, especially we need Steve, because all the engineers were used to having him as a guiding force. And to 
to have me do it was a very, um, you know, uh, the booby prize. So, um, but nonetheless, I, I gave it my best shot, and then right as I was getting into it, they pulled me out of there and said, oh, you have to save us because we have, the, the, I was mentioning to you the product Lisa, that was failing dramatically. You have to figure out how to phase out the Lisa in the market. So I did that and then I quit because I was, I just thought, I don't know what's going on in this company anymore. And then I found out what was going on. They were trying to get rid of Steve. Literally two months after I left, Steve was fired. And then uh, a whole new apple rose from the ashes. Yaren, you had a question? Failing, did it fail because of poor marketing, like because people didn't buy, or did it fail technically? It, it failed because of poor marketing, uh, primarily, because it was, um, it was supposed to be the most uh, sophisticated uh, Apple product to date that Apple had produced, and it was being sold as a, uh, with the consumer marketing behind it. It had uh, some, uh, reliability issues, and they were very poorly addressed. Um, they tried to sweep it under the rug. They fixed it very quickly, but instead of acknowledging that they had, had problems with it, they immediately uh, went into you know spin mode at first. So it's not that they were professionally trained marketing people. It's, it's not that. I have to tell you that the tech industry, there's, as far as I know, there's only one example, in the t but I may be wrong, in the tech industry where you get people who don't know technology and are able to succeed. And that was Gerstner with IBM. He came from... I don't know where he came from, actually, but he was from the consumer... He was from... He was non technology person and he was put to run IBM and he actually managed to turn it around and make it uh, successful again when they went, were going down the, down the tubes. In every other case where they thought that they could bring in somebody who had never done any tech before and actually run the, uh, a technology company or be in charge of the marketing, um, uh, as far as I know, every single one of those cases has failed. Because you have to have it in your blood. If you don't understand it, you can't talk to the engineers. It's still based on innovation and creativity of the tech talent. If you can't be close to your tech talent, if you don't understand it and you don't understand what future holds in technology, uh, you know, you have to have it in your blood. You don't have it. It's very hard. I mean, so I, okay, so I was the counterexample. I came from archaeology and so on. But he, that's a little bit misleading because my undergraduate degree was from MIT. I, you know, I had done a lot of programming. I had done, I was pretty familiar with, with what was going on. It was not, I was not a total, I don't know, you know, what's going on. You at least have to have the enthusiasm of a, a, a technology um, admirer, right? Otherwise, you're, you're not going to succeed. Yeah. Oh, Real yeah. quick, you're in the second question. So I was oh, just sorry. wondering if you remember um, what were the strategies that people used that were ineffective, and I guess you already Oh, answered. ineffective? Yeah. Well, I think one of the, stra the strategies uh, that was least effective was uh, the, the fact that they didn't uh, tout the features of the product. They didn't tell people, because in the 1980s it was still, <clears throat> excuse me, it was still early adopters, right? These are people who really want to know what they're buying, what's under the hood. And their mistake was to not inform the customer exactly what they were getting. So that was, that was part of the problem. They glossed over it and it was more 
um, oh, you know, you can hold more recipes on the hard disk, you know, that kind of thing. Just so that everyone can hear it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I have two questions just because we're on that trend. So uh, my first question is, if you could go back in time and tell your 25-year-old self something, what advice would you give yourself? Oh, boy. Oh, that's a hard one. Let me think about it. Um, what advice would I give myself? Um, I think um, I had the opposite problem, I think, of what I was just talking about with people who don't understand the tech. I would get, I would get so carried away with loving the features or the technology or whatever uh, that I did not um, I did not focus enough, I think, on uh, being a little bit more realistic about what was out there already. So for example, uh, <laughs> you know, we were trying to sell a product against the IBM PC and no one, of course I wasn't in charge of it at the time, but still, I should have thought of it. Nobody had done a, a, a comparison, a price, a price feature comparison and said, here's what you get with the IBM PC and here's what you get with the Mac for the same price. So, you know, are they comparable? Is there a value proposition? Um, it was too much head in the clouds kind of kind of thing. You know, I um, the, the first markets for the Macintosh, which I uh, pioneered, I mentioned to you the international market, and the the second one was the, the educational market, the uh, higher educational market, and for a long time that those two were the main markets for the Macintosh until the Macintosh got a hard disk and became a little bit more robust. Um, those were the, the two markets that sustained, uh, sustained the Mac. And in that sense, I, I, I think um, uh, it was, I don't know where I pulled it out of the hat. I kind of pulled those out of the hat. I, it wasn't done by analysis. It was kind of based on intuition. And, uh, but, Again, I should have been a little bit more rigorous and tried to understand why exactly we were not doing well in some of the other markets. It was not as, um, uh, it was a little bit too much of the seat of the pants. Um, and then my second question, um, with technology and globalization at, you know, at, at, on a rise, um, what would you say um, how important is it to be culturally educated in the tech industry at this moment? Oh, I think it's very important. I really do. Uh, oh, absolutely. Uh, uh, you know, I think it was very important then, and it's become ten times or hundred times more important now. Uh, uh, absolutely, it's uh, you know you have to be able to to uh, uh, adapt to what people perceive. Uh, they should not be looking at a product and saying, "Oh, it was made in the U.S." Right? They should not be doing that. They should look at it and say, "Oh, you know, maybe my neighbor down the street did it." You know. It has to feel completely familiar, and this was the argument I was making in the 80s to to um, to Apple, is that it has to feel like it's done in your country, that it's not imported from some weird place or from the U.S. So, so, uh, and I, I'll give you a, a, an example of that. Sony in the 19 80s was thought of as an American company. If you asked an average person on the street in America who is Sony, they would say, oh, it's a company in New York, or, you know, it's an American company. If you told them it was a Japanese company, people were shocked. They had no idea that it was a Japanese company. Now, of course, Sony products did not have very much 
software, it was primarily hardware, which was much easier to make universal. But nonetheless, the company image was such that everyone in every country thought Sony was their company. In France, people thought Sony was French. In Germany, they thought it was German. So Sony, for us at that time, was, was a model of what could be achieved. And I think that's what you want to achieve, is to feel like you are familiar to the, whoever you're selling it to. Uh, <laughs> so I'll repeat for everyone, when you joined the Mac team, did you feel like it was going to succeed? Did you like the idea? Did you feel like it was going to fail? And especially once it started getting delayed so long, did you, were you worried that it wasn't going to work out? Uh, actually, you know, it's so weird. And I think maybe it's the optimism of youth, but it, I, never, I never thought it wasn't going to succeed. What I thought was that, the, that it was going to... Uh, take a much longer to succeed. I mean, my, one of my biggest issues when we were shipping the Macintosh for the first time were the forecasts. I was constantly trying to cut the forecasts, and Steve Jobs was constantly trying to raise the forecasts. So we were f fighting over forecasts nonstop. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, um, I had, so I, I thought, okay, at least I can do the reasonable forecast for areas that I have control over, which was international. So I talked to all the countries, the, and we got our forecast. I handed it in, and behind my back, Steve Jobs called them and said, I'm not going to give you any product if you don't up your forecasts fivefold. So all of a sudden, I get these forecasts from them that are you know, much bigger. I'm calling them and saying, what the hell happened? They said, oh, Steve he's, said he's not going to give us any product at all if we don't up the forecasts. So uh, those, you know, that was one of my biggest fights, is let's be reasonable. Let's be at least a little bit reasonable. Um, by the way, it was exactly, our forecasts internationally were almost exactly what we had predicted. And the, unfortunately, the US was about five times less, which is what caused all the problems. Uh, in 1985-86. Can you talk a little bit about what it was like to be a woman in the tech industry at that time? Um, well, you know, actually, you know, I never really felt like uh, I was anything but a member of the, of the, of the team or, it, in 1980s, um, you know, there was, I can't think of a situation was I, where I was any different or treated any differently from anybody else. The first time where I experienced some, uh, uh, I, 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 you know, I, I frankly was shocked uh, when uh, the General Magic in the 1990s, we, we had partners uh, which were big companies, including AT&T and Motorola. And when I started working with them, that was the first time I ever encountered any kind of uh, uh, slight or being treated differently from, um, f from the rest of the team. But, in the tech industry, I, uh, from my own personal experience, I have never experienced anything that was different. Now, uh, I can tell you one th thing that was, that I think has changed since I was, uh, since I was in tech industry, and that is when this little guy was born, or he was little at that time, obviously, not so little anymore. Can I tell a story, those stories? So uh, um, I went back to work after three weeks after he was born. Um, it was a startup. There were no maternity leaves or anything like that. And even if there were, I wouldn't have taken one because we were in the middle of you know, going strong. It was a startup situation. So, so um, 
um, so I, ha I was breastfeeding. <laughs> and if you are in an office with cubicles, which are this tall, right? And you're breastfeeding, anybody who's taller than that, who walks by, is, uh, is of course going to be seeing in. But I, I couldn't be breastfeeding him every four hours while I was working, so this may get too graphic for you guys. But anyway, I was pumping milk, right? So there is a... Actually, it's now uh, most offices in the Valley have rooms for that. Well, that has changed. You see progress. So here I am in this, in this cubicle, right, with this pumping machine, electric, you know, right, going. So everybody all around knows that I, I'm pumping. And everybody who walks by can kind of <laughs> become an unwitting witness to this, right? So those kinds of things are, thank God, have changed. Um, but uh, it wasn't really, nobody gave me a hard time because of that, or nobody thought that that was unusual uh, or anything like that. So, uh, but it was very inconvenient and it was very, in some cases, embarrassing, especially since we had partners from other countries, you know, who were not as used to those kinds of things. So they were all on the same floor with these, with these small cubicles. So I think the hardest thing, frankly, as a woman was when I, uh, when I uh, became a, a mother. It was just not as amenable to that. But I have to say that uh, I also knew that that was going to be the case because um, I chose to to join a startup, and you know, that's what that's what happens sometimes when you're in a startup situation. Yeah. Let me check on time. Okay, a couple more. Uh, yes. Did you ever work with Steve Wozniak on any particular project, and how different was it? Uh, like, how would you compare Steve Jobs with Steve Wozniak? Oh, uh, they're very different people. <laughs> they're very different people. Um, I did not work on a project with uh, Wozniak. Um, when, we, when Steve Jobs took over uh, the Macintosh project, he brought in a lot of the people he had worked with before, including uh, people who had done the product design, like Jerry Manick, who designed the case, and he designed the first Macintosh. And he, he brought in a lot of tech people, uh, tech, uh, uh, you know, people who were doing the wire wrapping and uh, the, the, the helping with the putting together the first demo units and so on. He brought in his own people. We already had a hardware guy who I mentioned to you was a high school dropout who was, a, he was amazing. But I mean, he, he, was a, he, he, was, he was brilliant and his inspiration was Steve Wozniak, you know. So he was, they got along very well. What happened uh, is that Steve Wozniak came by the Macintosh a few times and he was just getting interested when he had an airplane accident. And uh, it was a pretty serious accident. So he was piloting the plane, and it, it crashed. It's a, but so he was in recovery for a few months. And by that time, we had moved, uh, uh, made quite a bit of progress. So he couldn't come join us uh, anymore. But he would drop in periodically. They, are, they were very, very different people. They complemented each other very well. Uh, Steve Wozniak is a prankster. He's an engineer's engineer. He is incredibly creative, as an in, uh, technically creative. He's a fun guy. He doesn't have an evil bone in his body. You know, he's always nice. He can't say no to people. He was taken advantage of. I can't tell you how many times because he couldn't say no. And people in this valley, you know, when you, uh, there were a lot of hangers on. People who would see you're successful and they kind of latch onto you and see, you know, if they could milk you for um, whether product ideas or for money or whatever. And poor Waz was always being manipulated in some way or another. You know, he'd be losing money this way or that way because he couldn't say no to these 
people, you know. He's a really uh, a very nice guy. And it took him a long, long time to be able to um, at least uh, have uh, his wife now, who is actually managing and making sure that he doesn't get taken advantage of. So whereas Steve Jobs is ex was extremely business savvy, he had it in his bones from the very beginning. He, he was uh, an incredible negotiator, an amazing and creative negotiator. You know, he would come up with ideas during negotiation and you'd say, wow, you know, how did he think of that? So um, he, on the business side, he was just, uh, he was a creative genius when, we fir when I first met him on the business side and product des design, just understanding what kind of product should be going into the market um, and what it should look like to the minutest detail, to the minutest detail. Uh, but uh, to the point where, you know, you, you, the layout of the board had to be aesthetic, right? Nobody sees it, the Macintosh couldn't be opened. Nobody saw the layout of the board, but it had to look beautiful. So um, Steve, Steve Jobs had those kinds of compunctions, you know, just very keen eye for the smallest detail, an amazing business negotiator. And then he became an amazing business strategist with age. When he came back from the whole next experience to Apple, uh, he was, uh, and he was incredibly daring. I mean, he, he took the kinds of risks that, uh, he, when he invested in Pixar and kept feeding Pixar, he had hardly any money left. He was supporting Pixar when he was really down, uh, but he, he saw the future of it and he was determined. He, he took huge risks with, uh, with his life, with his money, with his ideas. It was just an enormous risk taker. Um, was too, but he takes risks within his creative designs. You know, he makes this. He would make these amazing things with very few resources um, in the uh, in his hardware designs and in his software designs for the Apple II. But they are very, very different people. Okay, last one. They never gotten this far back, so we'll go with Mohammed because our first. <laughs> third row. I know that you were one of the few who got awarded the person who did the best job standing to Steve Jobs. So can you tell us a little about that and how Jobs reacted to these things? Well, so I have to tell you, when I read that, I thought, I have no idea what they're talking about. Because I don't remember receiving any award. Now, of course, I talked to your dad, and he says, I remember. And whoever told them the story, I think it was Debbie Coleman, actually, who told them the story, because she got, she got it eventually herself as well. But I had no recollection of it. So I, had, I, I, don't, I have a very bad memory of, of, of certain things. So I don't remember getting that award, but I guess I must have. But anyway, um, the, the thing is that uh, I think I already mentioned to you where I would have uh, um, uh, contradictions and conflicts with Steve. Um, he was pretty good in, uh, in, in um, taking uh, uh, opposing ideas, but it took a long, long time before he had enough confidence in you so that he would actually take those ideas seriously. So that period was very trying for a lot of people who would start working with him because, so he would come, for example, and I'm sure he did that about me too to other people. He would come and say, oh, is Jack any good? Hey guys, what do you think? Is Jack any good? Does he know what he's doing or is this all bullshit, you know? He, he was very, um, uh, very quick to see people's weaknesses, and if he thought that there was something to be gained on pressing on that weakness, on that Achilles heel, he would do it. And I think it was very hard for some people uh, to take. But he was very good at taking ideas, at least eventually. He would 
at first he would say, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard. And then I can tell you about the, the, the Mac, Macintosh original business plan that I was writing for him so that he could present it to the board of uh, directors of Apple and the executive committee to get funding for the, uh, for the project as a product, not just as a small research uh, enterprise. So, uh, I wrote the, the business plan. He went and read it and came back and said, this is bullshit. This is complete bullshit. So I thought, okay, tell me, tell me what is bullshit. So of course, I had come from academia, and some of it was bullshit, because a lot of what you write in academia, frankly, is bullshit. You know, you do a lot of uh, introductions, big words, and so on to explain something simple. So. I had done a little bit of that, so when he said it's bullshit and he pointed it out, I went and cleaned it up, you know, t took it out. I thought, yes, he's right. All of that is grandiose and it will oh, let me take out all the bullshit. So then I presented to him again and he says, this is terrible. This is awful. This is worse than before. And I thought, oh my God, it can't be worse than before. What is the problem with it? Well, you know, uh, it wasn't concrete. It's not like the market size or the market segments or anything. It's like, well, you know, I just don't like the way it's presented. And besides, you know, there is a... <laughs> he wanted to have a, a market of administrative assistance, right? Uh, that was, a, at that time, the politically correct term for secretary. So he wanted to put in a market for administrative assistance. And I thought, well, the, uh, administrative assistants don't buy their own equipment. I mean, this is, that doesn't make any sense. But anyway, so I thought, what else could be the problem with it? So then one day I thought, you know what? I bet he doesn't like the way it looks. So 